Good morning. It is good to be with you today. Uh, my name is Pastor Travis. I'm so thankful uh, to get the opportunity to be one of your pastors here. Uh, we are at two years that my self and my family came to this church, and from day one, what we realized uh, is that this church loves its people, right? Loves its pastors. Uh, we're very thankful to be a part of a community like this. As we're in this series, Pastor Tim um, opened this series last week. We're talking about what it looks like to be a community, right? Uh, different aspects as we look at um, this call uh, as a Christ follower, as people come into this place, who we're called to be and how we're called to respond. Um, I get the opportunity today to talk about grace and uh, something that I have experienced in big ways, and I'll share a little bit of my story here in a little bit. Um, but what I hope uh, is that every Sunday when you come in here and when you gather to meet, uh, when you open the Word of God, uh, that you realize that the, the formative nature of the Holy Spirit is to come in in the dark places of your life and to begin to reshape it how it was originally intended. We all understand that there is darkness and there's sin in the world. And we all understand that as we have given ourselves to this sin, it's reformed and reshaped areas and aspects of our life and the way that we think, the way that we process, how we love people. So the hope is as Christ comes in and begins to do a miracle in our life, we begin to start to look how he created us to look. And the world begins to look how he created it to look. And we believe that we can bring heaven here now, right? It's not like waiting for this far off thing, but like we can bring heaven to everyday moments. And so uh, just one thing that I want to highlight just by way of announcement, uh, we uh, had a fundraiser uh, this morning uh, for our missions trip to Latacunga, Ecuador. We have been in partnership with them for several years, uh, have built churches, and uh, we're sending a team, uh, I think it's second or third week of May. And um, inside of that, obviously there's cost associated. And so a way that we felt like we could raise some money was make you guys some breakfast. How was the breakfast this morning? Pretty good? Pretty good? Oh, it was okay, I guess. It was middle of the road is what that clap sounded like, right? Um, one of the things that we also did is we had some baskets that were donated and then uh, some other things that you could silent auction bid. So 15 minutes following the service until about 11.45, that bidding is open, so you can bid. All of those proceeds, 100%, will go to support the trip. Uh, the other thing that you can bid on is who your favorite pastor is. Now, here's what I know. Um, I, I have the microphones. This is great. Here's what I'm going to say. Uh, what you get the opportunity to do is with uh, you and five of your closest friends, uh, you can have dinner at your favorite pastor's house. Now, what I know is that I'm going to come in second. That's fine. We already know that. Let's just level the playing field. But here's what I want. I want to come in a close second, right? Let Make it close, because, like, my ego would get crushed a little bit if it's not a close second. So I have that out of the way. Uh, thank you very much for supporting. You guys are a very generous church, and it's not about hoarding resources, but how, can we, how we can help others. Amen? Um, so this morning, I, I get the opportunity to talk about what the gospel means. Uh, here's the reality is that every single person in this room and all throughout humanity, we have fallen short of God's glory. Uh, as sin entered into the world, uh, we have worshipped things that aren't God. We have belittled and mocked God with our lives, our mouths, our minds. And we have given ourselves into things, and God's response to that is to make a way for us to be reconciled. That word means to be made right before God who created all things through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We celebrate it at Easter. The sacrifice that Christ paid was for your sins. He paid the penalty and the consequence for your sins so that you could have life, right? So we get the twofold movement of that work. The first is that we get Christ's righteousness, his right standing before God. And the second thing is Christ takes upon himself our rebellion and our, sinless, or our sinfulness. So when God looks at us, he sees Christ, and he deems us spotless and blameless before him. Does anybody need that this morning? I need that. This is the gospel. Two things I want to make very clear as we talk about community of grace. Um, the law shows you the problem. So when we talk about uh, the law, the Mosaic law, the scriptures, it shows you that there is a problem, but it has no ability to save you. Are we on the same page there? Here's what I know. Uh, it lets you know that there is that problem. The law is holy, and it is divine, but it cannot bring the help like Christ does. The second thing that I want to make very clear is that what Christ did for you is not a license to sin. Here's where I feel like some people get this wrong, right? Um, 
they, they receive Christ in their heart, and then they choose to still continue to go out to the world and actively sin, actively choose the opposite of what God wants for them. And here's what I would say to us this morning is that thinking that God will forgive me if I do this and don't do this, and then I will do whatever I want, God will forgive me. If you are converted and you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, I would say uh, you will not look at it like this. Agreed? If you think this right there that you can sin and have relationship with God, you don't understand the gospel, and I would, I would question whether or not you're born again. Now, here's what I want to say, is that when I came to Christ and accepted him into my life, I came with filthy rags before him, broken pieces, shards of my life. And the formation that has taken place in my life, I have stumbled along the way, but the reality is, is that as every day I wake up and I say, hey God, may maybe I messed up yesterday. The reality is, is that I can ask for his continued guidance in my life and I can continue to listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting in my life. Does anybody have a story like that this morning? Now, I am not perfect, but I am pursuing the perfect Jesus that lived this life how we were intended to live it and showed us the way to live and marked it out through the pages of Scripture so that I can choose every single day to wake up and be formed and shaped by him. Now, Paul continues to pound on the same drum, so we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 15. I want to use this verse 15 through 21 passage to kind of unravel what it means to be a community of grace. So I hope you could be with me this morning. Here's where we're going to start. Um, we ourselves are Jew by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we level the playing field there, right? I'm not going out trying to earn this. I realize that it's through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order that to be justified by faith in Christ. So again, he says it again there, right? And not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So you can't earn it. You can't go out there and do enough. You can't believe enough. All you have to do is put faith in Jesus, and you can have it. Paul, what he's saying here is that there was a moral advantage that the Jews had. The Jews had the law. The Gentiles didn't. The Jews had the prophets. The Gentiles didn't. The Jews had the promises, and the Gentiles didn't, and the Jews had the signs, and the Gentiles didn't. And he was saying if there was ever a moral advantage of right standing before God, he was like, it's the Jews. But Paul's argument, you guys ready for this? Very theological. Who cares? Who cares? He was like, we try to hold these things up like, well, I was, I was raised in this family. I went to this church, and I was a part of this denomination. It's like, all that stuff is filthy rags in God's sight. He says, get before me, lay those things down at my feet, and be rebuilt into the image of who I created you to be. He says, who cares? The law justifies no man. Whoever had the law from the very beginning made no, no difference at all. And so what I would ask for you right now is that, how was your home growing up? Was it pretty good? Were you loved over? Were you prayed over? Were you taught Jesus? On the contrary, were you neglected, abused, betrayed? Different stories and different backgrounds are represented here this morning, and I realize that like we all come from different realities. I would never seek to compare my pain to your pain. And as I've served in youth ministry, I've realized some of the stories that people have walked through, I don't know how they wake up every morning, right? And I'm thankful to be in a family that did bring me to church. So here's what I know. Paul's point, when it comes to right standing before God, any moral advantage you received upon birth does not bring about your justification, right? That right standing before God. So if your dad was a pastor, your mom gave birth to you on the altar, first off, gross, right? <laughs> but if you had been faithful to the church, you read your Bible every single day, Never been drunk, never, never done drugs, you were a virgin till you were married, only watched the Left Behind series and the Moses movie and maybe the Chosen series, right? But if you did all those things, but none of this other junk, and you think I have it, the Bible says that when it comes to justification or right standing before God, you are no better than the son of an addict who grew up in an, an environment that is anti-God, dark, self-centered, full of promiscuity, who has lived in every deplorable way possible. Here's the reality and the truth for all of us this morning so we can level the playing field. We all need a Savior. We all need a Savior. It is Jesus. I'm no better than you by standing on this stage. The reality is, is I needed a Savior. 
We have to get over ourselves, church. Are you with me? We have to get over ourselves. Whether you grew up in church and you had all the caravan badges, or you have no idea what I just said when I said caravans, and this is your first Sunday here this morning. This morning I am talking about right standing before God. What I can tell you is that there are advantages to having a family like the family that I had. It's non-justifying, are we there? But there are advantages. To being raised in a family that loved the Lord, brought me to church, and showed me the way to walk the Lord. I read this quote this week, and I want to show you guys because I think it's so profound. The best a parent can do is gather kindling around their child and pray that the Holy Spirit ignites it. We stand around our kids all the time, and we like it's like we're trying to light this fire, and it's the Holy Spirit's work through us. The Holy Spirit uses us. I have no ability to save my kids. My dad always said, I will lay myself down between you and the gates of hell, and you get the choice whether or not you want to step over me and walk into sin, but I promise you where you're heading is not a good place. And we all have our youthful moments where we kind of walk that way. I'm thankful that I didn't have to go too far to realize that this is the best life for me. You can have that same ability too. I believed in Jesus for a very long time because it's what my parents wanted from me, right? And I think some of us in this room right now have that same story. We believed in Jesus for a long time, and some of you, you have kids that you raised and brought to church, and you're wondering why they walked away. And the reality is, is it's the Holy Spirit's work as he ignites, and we just continue. Like, if your job's not done in putting that kindling around them. Do you know that? You should still be stacking up that wood around them and saying every opportunity, I'm going to speak the truth, I'm going to be honest, I'm going I'm to be loving, I'm going to be full of grace, but the reality is, is I'm never going to justify your sin, but I'm going to continue to point you to Jesus. Now, what we want for our children is that the Holy Spirit of God would open their souls and that they would begin to open their faith. Like, I don't want, I don't want my kids to have my faith, right? I think they can learn about faith by watching me, so I think I'm an example. I want them to own their faith and make it their own so that when they deal with the challenges that are waiting for them out there, they can stand the test of time with the strength of the Holy Spirit. There's no one, or there is one who justifies and the law never will. So we, we on the same page there? We good? Okay, I'm going to move on. Galatians 2, 17 through 18, it says, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. So I want to give you a little context. Um, The Bible is one story, right? Now, I can read one book of the Bible, but to take it out of context, you miss the larger story of what's going on. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul calls Moses, uh, yeah, because of, he was a minister of what was written, he calls him a minister of condemnation and sin. It's like, if you feel like you're doing good, and then somebody's like, that person's a minister of condemnation and sin, you'd be like, what are you talking about? Here's what he's talking about here. Uh, that the law entered the scene and lets us know that we are sinners. That's what he's referencing. Can you guys imagine that moment? Like, uh, they're at Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses is up, and they're down there, and they're, like, kind of making a golden calf. And they, like, had no rules, really, at that point. They didn't have the law. And then Moses comes down, and he's like, you shall have no other gods before me. And it's almost like two people slide together to block the golden calf that they had just made. They're like, buh, this is awkward, Right? He's like, you should not covet. Like, it goes through this whole list of things. Probably some massive gulps. I thought, when I was reading this, I thought about, you guys remember that Little Caesars commercial where the guy goes in, he's like, $5 pizza, and he takes his shirt off, and the guy from the back goes, put your shirt on. He's like, there's one rule, right? Puts his shirt back on. I think about that moment, right? The people were functioning like there was no rules, and all of a sudden he comes in with these rules, and here's the point, is that the law shows you that you have fallen short. It shows you this reality that, like, you can't, it it feels overwhelming. If I was to go through all of the laws and all of the ways that I was supposed to live and, like, I can't drag a chair across the ground and, like, even the way that I make my food, all of that stuff was so rigid to the point where it was overwhelming. And the quantity of people that probably walked away because they were like, I can't do this. Do you guys feel like that sometimes? He talks about the the yoke that we take on, this, this burden of what Christ calls us into. It's easy and it's light. It was made for you. The journey and what I offer you this morning is a life with Christ where it's like, yeah, you're going to deal with some challenges out there, but the burden becomes a little lighter because you know who's walking with you. Remember how I talked about, like, 
uh, the resurrection means it's taken away the sting of death, that we don't have to fear death, we don't have to fear tomorrow because it's already his anyways, and so we just trust him and we walk with him every single day, right? Paul's argument is that if Christ come simply with more rules, then he has not come to bring life and light and righteousness, but more sin and condemnation. So what he came to do, Paul's argument is that Christ has come not with more rules, he came to take God's wrath from you. You guys with me? And what he came to do is to be your righteousness, freeing you from the effects of the fall. And what we get in return, rescuing us from the grasp of death and sin, he is not coming in saying, I have come to, the f- to fulfill the law, now here is more law to follow, right? That's not what he's doing. He's coming in and it's this invitation. The law shows you that you have fallen short, that it created space between you and God, and a great separation is realized between the holiness of God and you. It makes God feel far off. But here's what I know, the law creates space between you and God. Jesus fills that space and reconciles you, makes you right before God. Do you understand? Do you guys understand that this work is done literally by a kneel of a knee and an invitation with a prayer that says, I don't know what all this means, but I trust you and I want to follow you. Show me the way. And every single day, I will try to, I will try to grow in this with the help of the Holy Spirit. Put people in my life that are going to help me so, so that you're able to worship him and love him and serve him and make much of him and enjoy him and have this deep and intimate relationship with him. Guys, I am living proof of the reality of what Christ can do, the transformation that can take place in your life if you just let him do it. He loves you so much. He loves you this much. He died on a cross for your sins. And some of you, you're actively continuing to live in sin, and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is beckoning you forward to say, like, don't do this. Where it's leading is only pain and suffering, and, and it's, it's going to fracture your life and your relationships. What he goes on to say in Galatians 2.19, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. Now, in our, in our house, I love to have fun. If you know me long enough, you know I like to have fun, right? So at the greenhouse, two rules. Uh, primary rule, let's have fun. Uh, but also there's a secondary rule that uh, be safe. So if, if, there's, if there's a rule that like all of a sudden supersedes, it's like in that moment, Liam has oftentimes said, hey, I was just being silly when he does something that is damaging to his sister or the environment or other people, right? If Liam climbed up to the top of our house at the highest point and was going to jump off under the mantra of this is fun, he is automatically taken away the be safe piece. So do you guys understand, like when Paul's talking about a greater law here, what he's doing is he's restructuring what it means to live for God. Growing up in a church, people would point to some moral external action. A list of do's and don'ts was how I get right before God. And that was exhausting, right? But here's what I'll tell you. As Christ transformed and reshaped my heart, all those do's and don'ts began to naturally take place. Because my heart began to align with his heart, my mind began to align with his mind, and he began to reshape and reform who I was from the inside out. Right? Anybody else have that happen with them? Right? But if I come in and I try to behave your modification situation, like I just try to tell you, don't do this and do this and don't do this and don't, and I give you this list of like 7,000 things that you got to go through, you're going to get to like page seven and then you're going to be like, this is too much. I can't, I can't do this. And you guys not think that that's why Jesus came? Because there was this long list of do's and don'ts and it was not attainable by any human. And so he came and took on flesh so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Paul is saying that you have missed what it truly means to live for God. And here's what it means to live for God. It means to have faith in Christ, first and foremost, and then to make much of God because of Christ. Faith in in Jesus, faith in who he is, faith that he really did come, faith that he lived a perfect life, faith that he died, faith that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and faith that he is coming again. And then to make much of God means that the way that I navigate each moment when I have these thoughts come in or these moments of temptation, I realize that my love for God is there and with only the help of the Holy Spirit can I overcome this temptation. Are you with me? And even if I stumble and fall, it's like running a marathon race. Even if I stumble off this stage to just lay there and be like, well, it's over now. Or 
to pick myself up, brush myself off, and with the help of other people and the Holy Spirit, I can get up and continue to move forward towards Christ. Are we with me this morning? I believe that God is trying to invite us into this. That is pleasing to God, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So a life lived unto God is a life lived in faith in Christ Jesus. I want to go back to Isaiah 64. Like I said, Scripture is so beautiful in the way that it weaves all this together. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. That means like every single time I try to like go and figure it out myself and I try to bring it to God, I'm like, look what I made, like look what I did. We try to do this like show and tell moment, like that earns us right standing before God and he's like, all you had to do was have faith in me. All this other stuff in comparison to what Christ did for you is filthy rags, right? He said, we all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Take all your good deeds, your right upbringing, lay them before God, and it's filthy. The sacrifice that God is pleased with is a broken and a contrite spirit and a faith in the Son of God. I want to level this to the point where you realize, like, you came in here probably feeling some things. Some of you, you come in on your merit and the way that you dress and how you act and what you say, and then you go and you live lives that aren't as shiny as they look on the outside sometimes. And some of you, you, you even feared the moment of stepping in this church because you were, you were scared of judgment. You were scared of more behavior modification. You were scared of like, what will they think of me? I don't look like them. I don't sound like them. I don't come from the same backgrounds as them. But the reality is to, li- to, to begin to live for God in a way that shows us the glory of God. And what it says in Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is no longer Travis who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Are we there? And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There is an unbelievable amount of freedom if you can get this. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life in Christ, what accusation could befall you? Like people try to accuse me, they try to point at things, they try to say you were this, and it's like because of Christ, what accusation can befall me? I am alive in Christ. It is Christ who is the true and perfect judge, and I will stand before him one day and I will be held accountable for the things that I've said and what I've done, and the reality is is that moment when I accepted Christ into my heart and I'm actively moving forward in him, no longer does God see Travis and all the sin and all the temptation and all the struggle. What he sees is the righteousness and the right standing of God. He sees the blood of Christ that was shed for me so that I could have life. I don't care about behavior modification. I want to see you right before God. And if you say, Travis, I want to give my life to Christ, what does this mean? And we walk in this together. You give me invitation to call you out, to to say, like, why are you living this way? It is only leading to more pain and more struggle. And if you invite that in and you continue to cling things and hold things back, like you will stand before God one day with those things that you held back. And what he's saying is just give it to me now because the cost is going to be great. You get a choice every single day when you wake up. Who will be your Lord? Who will you serve? Who will you love? And what I know, like I've said this time and time again, I am not perfect. But grace is that though you have sinned, though you have fallen short, Though you have walked away, though you have turned your back, though you have fallen, Christ paid for it. He paid for it. I've had that happen before. Uh, Tim actually preached a a message on generosity. My brother was sitting in the seats uh, and said, like, hey, pay for someone's meal or whatever. So my brother sitting over, he sees this old lady come in with a meal. Uh, She, uh, he tells the waitress, hey, I'll take her bill, right? She goes up to the front, she leaves, and he's like, man, I really did a good thing. Well, come to find out, she had gone in and bought like six pies as well. And his bill was like, it was was a lot of money. And he's like, what did she order? That was one lady, right? But can you guys imagine that moment as the lady, she comes with all this stuff and sets it down and she goes to pull out her billfold and to realize that the price is paid? 
Can you imagine that same moment when you stand in heaven one day and you realize that, like, I was supposed to go to hell, I was supposed to die, I was supposed to literally be obliterated because of my sin, because of my, my struggle, my temptation, and for him to say, Jesus paid for it. Amen. And just by faith in Christ, you now can walk into eternity. That's a beautiful moment. So this is the confidence that you and I have through faith in the Son of God, that we are, as a community, immovable, unshakable, falling more in love with him, leaning on him, seeking him, and led by him. And for those that have fallen short, to use the law is only going to paralyze you. And it will sever the power of the Holy Spirit in the relationship with God who created all things. But if you understand that through faith in Jesus, what I have been given by the grace of God is Christ's righteousness, then I am empowered and emboldened to keep on pursuing him to be set free, and to pursue him all the more. And here's what I know. Get your eyes off of you and onto Jesus, and everything will change. Right. Get it off of you. It's not about you. Like, we try to make it so much about us. Like, every, every moment, every environment, every get-together with family or friends, like, we try to make it about ourselves. And, like, get, you, get it off of you and put it onto Jesus. And start seeing the relationships and the things in your life start to change as a result. If I got my eyes off of me and onto Jesus, don't you think that no matter who walked in those doors or who I encountered out in my everyday life or who I worked with, I would begin to see like what Jesus is trying to do in their life and I can play a little bit, a little part in it? That's, that's where we're at this morning. It's, it's not about you, it's about him. If you meditate on, think on, glory in who Christ is, the more free you will be and the more victory that you will walk in. So here's what I'll say. Don't celebrate yourself celebrate Jesus. Also, don't loathe you, right? Some of us, we like to sit in this deep, dark room and like just, oh man, I'm the worst person. Like, stop doing that. Because of the righteousness of Christ, you can stand blameless before him one day, and shouldn't that put a little pep in your step? Shouldn't that give you a little bit of like, man, if if God can do this for me, like, are you kidding me? Me? He can do it for you too. You walk with a little bit more confidence and you realize that, man, it's not about me, it's about him. And what it goes on to say in Galatians 2.21, it says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. (sighs) Right? What we see in the birth of Christ is this massive cosmic plan to come and redeem all things. You see a whisper of it in Genesis chapter 3. You see it again in Genesis 12. You see it in Genesis 15. You see it in the line of kings, again in the prophets, all the way up to the birth of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas. And this promise that a Messiah was coming and was going to accomplish what the law could not. Paul is saying that if you run back to the law, if you run back to these rituals and these rules, if you run back to trying to earn, if you, if you try to p- place that burden on the law on anybody for the sake of them earning it, Christ died for no purpose. You nullify the grace of God. This promise is that Christ came and accomplished for us what we could not. And I don't want to be the kind of person that makes the death of Christ meaningless, right? When I read the passage out of John chapter 5 of the, the man that was paralyzed for 38 years, and he was at the pool of Bethesda, and Jesus comes, tiptoes through all these people and finds him, and says, do you want to be well? He's like, well, you know, everyone, it's all these other people's fault, and tries to put it on them. Jesus says, do you want to be well? And Jesus heals him, and he walks away from something that had crippled him for so long. I have shared my story with you for the most part, right? People know my story, and I've shared it actively But here's what I know is that um, when I was in high school, I talk about like this house of cards moment falling down and everything that I was weaving my life in and around all of a sudden came crashing down and I walked through about a two year season of feeling like I was in a desert. And after that two years, it was like God gave me my purpose and he gave me my calling and he gave me my destiny and he told me that I was redeemed and restored, right? Well, the full story is, when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, you're a product of the people that you surround yourself with. I think we can all agree with that. I started hanging out with some people that uh, began stealing from local places, right? And here's a a kid that grew up in the church that uh, had a dad who was a pastor, was very well known in the community, began to participate in this lifestyle. 
And can you understand how, like, as you give yourself to sin, whatever that is, the enemy begins to rewire your mind the way that you think and see things? And I started justifying stealing that I'm not stealing from a person. I'm stealing from a company. And they have insurance, so it's a win-win. Do you guys see the flaw there? Well, one thing became two things, began to grow, 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 grow. Fast forward to I stole from the golf course that I was working at. And now I'm sitting in front of the state police. I'm being read my Miranda rights. And do you want to talk about the consequence of sin in that moment? You remember how I said sin robs you of all that is future and, like, <laughs> takes it from you? And I was sad at this moment as, as all of a sudden all of my sin was found out that I'm exposed in that moment. And I remember sitting there as they're reading this and I'm thinking, what does my future hold? But I, uh, knowing that, like, there has to be a way forward. There has to be. This isn't over. It can't be. And I remember as I sat across from the owner of the golf course and he said, Travis, I know the father that you had, that you have. I know the morals and the values that he raised you with. He said, you made a very bad decision and there are consequences to that and they're out of my hands. But he's like, you're better than this. God created you for more than this. And even those words, it was like hard to hear in that moment because I realized how much I had messed up. And like I said, we're all scared in some ways of being found out. But here's what I found. A year went by waiting for that moment that I would stand accountable for what I had done. And then it was like, do I apply to college? I think so. So I applied to college. I go to Olivet Nazarene University. I was going to study business, and then all of a sudden it was like I felt this call of God just rain down in my life. And I was like, me? I felt like Paul, worst of sinners. And you're saying you're going to use me? But here's the reality. Like, God, if you're calling me, then you already know my future, so I trust you. I'm going to sign the bottom of the contract. I'm going to slide it back to you, and you can write the story for me because I have shown that I'm really bad at it. Fast forward another year, and I'm sitting in a class, and I just felt this overwhelming sense that I needed to call the owner of the golf course. Take him to lunch. Like, that was going to pay it back, right? And can I just tell you guys, like, all the, all the way back when I had to pay for, I paid for stuff that I didn't even do. Do you know that? I, I paid for every single golf ball, all that kind of stuff that was taken, and it zeroed my account down to almost nothing. So talk about being at rock bottom, right? Now fast forward, and I'm sitting across from Gary Myers, owner of the golf course, businessman, very well respected in our community, and I am apologizing profusely about who I was. I'm ashamed. And Gary looked at me with tears in his eyes as I began to tell him God's plan and his purpose and his calling in my life and then I'm not that anymore, but I'm moving to this. And he said, when I gave it to the state police, it was out of my hands. But he said, I used my power and my influence in that moment to say, just watch Travis over this next five years. Keep the book on him. If, if, he, if he does this again, then all of this will happen. But as I walked in that season, there was always this awareness of like, that's wrong, don't do this. And we think about the cost of our sin. If, we, oh, if I just do it one more time, like there is a penalty beyond what you can understand. And as I was blown away in that moment, because for the first time, I saw from the human, <laughs> I saw from a human perspective what Christ had done for me. I didn't deserve it. And what I deserved, I did not get because there was something better just waiting if I was just willing to give it to him. So what I tell you this morning is that it's not by merit. It's not by earning. It's not because of upbringing. It's not any of this stuff that we try to bring before God. It's literally just surrender. It's saying like, I'm not going to hold things back. So I've never seen a sacrifice get up and walk off the altar, right? And we do that so many times in our relationship with God, but we say in these moments, God, I want to give it to you. I want to follow you. I want to trust you. And what better time than this morning? There's no better time. I don't stand up here trying to act like I've got it all figured out, but the reality is, is that I know what Jesus did for me and I believe and by faith in Jesus Christ, I can be justified and I am no longer who I was, but I am who I am becoming.
some of you in this room right now, you're holding on to stuff. You have walked into lives that you know you're not supposed to be in. You have done things that have circumvented the relationship that you coveted before God and before other people that you would walk in marriage with this person and now you are living in sin. And so the reality is, whether you're hiding pornography or you're in drug addiction or you're waiting for those papers to come in the mail that like you're gonna go to prison, the reality is, is like God came for all people. You are all people. There is nothing like, you can't exclude yourself. Well, well, all people is all these, but I'm over here. Like, it's not for me. No, it's for you. You just choose not to receive it. So this morning, I want you to stand with me. We're going to sing a song. And I've shared with you guys often that, you know, this is just wood with a place to kneel. But can I tell you that there's no better place to come to a moment of surrender than in a place where you've got a room full of people that are supporting you and loving you and celebrating and and, and spurring you on and holding you accountable. Like this is the place to do it. And what you can do is you can invite Christ into your heart in this moment and he can save you. And you don't have to be scared about tomorrow. You can just walk each day with him. I'm living proof of this, that you can have this as well. I'm gonna pray, we're gonna sing. There's going to be pastors across the front, but what I know is that God is trying to do something in your lives this morning if you're just willing and you're open and you're receptive. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we pray in these moments. I already sent your Holy Spirit here. God, this this freedom that I have experienced over these last 19 years has been unbelievable. And God, I believe that there are people that are still clinging to lives of sin right now. But God, I hope that my story and your story working through my story will just communicate just in this moment that they are loved, that they are, they were died for, and they can receive this gift of life if they would just be willing to receive it, we pray. So God, I pray in these moments, may we just be open, may we be honest, may we get it out into the open so that we can be free of it once and for all, we pray in Jesus' name.